right, so today I want to talk to you um, about the jet stream, which is really what I study. Um, I'll, don't worry, I'll tell you what the jet stream actually is in a minute. Um, but really, this is all about being a detective and looking for signals, in this case, potentially signals from human activity and their impacts on the jet stream. And this is really the thing I do and the thing I love to do is look in a bunch of noise, be it in the atmosphere or, um, or the Earth system, and try to find these signals. And this is sort of, I hope, what I've done in my career so far and what I hope to do for, for my, the coming decades here. Um, and throughout the talk, I do want to link it to the workshop that's going on. Um, the, I think there's some discussion of it in, in the brochure, um, and which is bringing many scientists here today um, to study what's going on at the poles and how it may impact, um, say, weather in lower latitudes. And that's part of what I want to touch on today. So um, when you think about the jet stream, a good place to start is first, well, what is it? And a good place to start with that is the history or its discovery. Now, um, I, I was just telling a gentleman up here that my, my grandfather actually flew, um, was a pilot um, in World War II. And it's actually in World War II that really people, the, Many scientists, at least, believe that this is when we discovered the jet stream. All of a sudden, pilots were getting in airplanes, and they were able to fly around 30,000 feet. And they noticed when they went one direction, namely east, they went a lot faster than when they went to the west. Okay? And pilots came back and reported this. And for example, in 1944, some B-29 bombers were flying from the North Mariana Islands to Tokyo and encountered wind speeds up at the levels where they were flying um, of up to 200 miles an hour. This is fast. This one is really fast. Um, and this, these, this, this observation really led to this huge amount of research over the next decade or two on the jet stream. And um, there was a bunch of papers that came out, namely from University of Chicago. And you know, they, they wrote all about what is this jet stream? What does it do? Why is it important? What's really interesting, however, and what a lot of people don't know, is that the jet stream was actually measured and potentially, if you will, discovered about 20 years earlier by a scientist in Japan. So I want to tell you a little bit about his story. So this is Wasaburo Oishi. Um, he was born in 1874, um, and he, he passed away in 1950. But what he did in December 2nd of 1924 is he, he was in charge of an observatory in to, uh, just outside of Tokyo. And using balloons, which he tracked from the ground with his group, he could watch how far they went in the sky and figure out how much time it took and try and back out how fast the wind was going, how fast that balloon was being carried. And when he did this, here's my little schematic to show you. This is up where the plane, about where an airplane is flying. This is down, you know, where, where his observatory is. This line here shows that speed he thought the wind was going. And what you can see is the winds appeared to get faster and faster as the balloon went up and up and up. And he thought, well, maybe this is just a fluke. Maybe this is just this one day. And so he went on to do this calculation over a period of three years. And he could do it for every season. And he discovered that no matter what season it was, the winds were always increasing as he went up and up, as the balloon went up and up into the air. And this is this idea of the jet stream. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't, I can't actually read this plot. So if anybody's trying, any guesses what language that is? You know, it looks sort of Italian, I'm not sure. OK. <laughs> so here, I'll translate for you. So these are the different, the different seasons showing that there's a jet stream in all seasons. It's certainly strongest in winter, because these values here are much larger. Um, and this is talking about the wind speed. But the reason, so I'll tell you in a second why you can't read it. But he wrote this up. He was very excited, and he published a paper. And he hoped that the whole international community would learn about this jet stream, because clearly this is an important thing. Um, but turns out he published the entire paper in Esperanto. <laughs> OK, and if you haven't heard of Esperanto, it is actually a made up language in the 1800s in an attempt to make the whole world potentially communicate with each other. So when you took an airplane from one place to the other, you could get off the plane and talk to the person on the ground. However, if, since we all aren't sitting here speaking Esperanto, this talk is not in that language, it didn't really catch on, unfortunately. And so this paper actually went relatively completely unnoticed, um, which is why. In the US, we typically attribute the discovery of the jet stream to, to the people working out of the University of Chicago 20 years later. All right, so here, here's your picture of the jet stream from, from Oishi's perspective, but what does it look like um, from a global scale? Um, so this is a picture of the winds at that level that Oishi was measuring up around where planes fly. Um, now you can see there's a lot of structure here, 
lot of things going on. The pink colors are the fastest winds. Um, the bluish green colors are slower. And I typically, when I look at plots like this, I, rather than get dizzy, I tend to squint my eyes. And if you squint your eyes, you can maybe see that there's a region in the northern hemisphere here where the winds appear to be stronger or more pink. And if you look in the southern hemisphere, you see this band here of more pink colors than, say, along the equator or at the pole. And these are our jet streams. So if one thing you can notice is that there's a jet stream in both hemispheres. There's a jet stream in the northern hemisphere. There's a jet stream in the southern hemisphere. And they both move from the west to the east. Now, just for, to help, I've put a tiny little green dot where we are right now. And over here is Japan. So you can see that jet stream right on top of where Oishi was. All right, so why might you care about the jet stream? It's this river of fast moving air. It gets faster as we move up. Um, around 30,000 feet, it's going about 200 miles an hour. That's pretty fast. So why might you care? Well, one, commercial air, airlines, um, this is where we fly. Um, and it's because we have this jet stream that, in essence, we're riding along in the one direction, but fighting in the other. Um, another important aspect of the jet stream is it can steer weather systems. An example is uh, Superstorm Sandy was steered into the east coast of the United States in 2012 and is in part attributed to, to the steering by this jet stream flow, um, which was a different that day than it typically is. Um, it, if the jet stream moves away from where you are, it can cause a lack of rain, potentially leading to drought if, it's, if it stays away for many days or weeks. On the other hand, if you're right under the jet stream, it can bring those storms over your head and cause snow and rainfall. So it matters for a, from a weather, just weather perspective, what kind of weather is falling you know, is over our heads. Um, it also impacts the oceans. The winds can make the oceans, can force the oceans and actually make the ocean circulation change. So it's really important in the, for, from this whole sort of Earth perspective. And finally, you know, as, as science nerds, it's really important for the climate system as a whole. Um, and it's actually very important in moving heat from the tropics to the polar regions. Um, so it's really important just in terms of the whole climate system. All right. So why, why do we have a jet stream? So that, of course, I could probably spend hours talking about all the nuanced details, but really I, I boil it down to, to two ingredients. First, um, we need a sun. <laughs> All right, so let's start really basic. With the sun, um, we know that the tropics are warmer than the poles. And this temperature difference is very important in giving us a jet stream. And the second thing we need is we need the Earth to rotate around. So the relatively basic ingredients, honestly. And together with just these two pieces, um, we can actually create jet streams. Now, of course, there's lots of complicated little pieces in there. The jet stream wasn't, is, is certainly a mess, if you look at this image, but those are the two main ingredients. And so when we talk about human activity or human impacts, I tend to like to go back to these two ingredients and say, where do humans come in? How could humans potentially change this, this, this feature of our atmosphere? And first of all, I would say that as, so far, to my knowledge, we don't impact the rotation of the Earth. All right. So right off the bat, the Earth is, going to, is continuing to spin at the same speed. We also, at the moment, don't really have much effect on the sun itself. So those two ingredients are so we're set with. But what we can do and what we can change, and what I'm going to talk about today is two ways that we've potentially changed um, the temperatures and the temperature distribution in our atmosphere. And thus, that's a way that humans can actually impact this jet stream by changing this piece or this part of the ingredients. OK, so I'm going to do two, talk to you through two examples today of how, how humans might impact the jet stream. So the first is the southern hemisphere ozone hole. And I'll talk a little bit about what that is. But this has to do with um, CFCs being emitted by human uh, aerosols for, or aerosol cans, for example, or refrigerators. This actually created an ozone hole, which can impact these colds and warm regions and thus impact what the jet stream is doing. And the second one I want to talk about is Arctic sea ice loss. Um, and the Arctic ice is melting, um, perhaps in part due to human activity. And so the question is, what does this mean for the jet stream and the weather pattern? So these are the two pieces I want, want to talk about. And I want to point out, we've only been two days into our workshop here. And already, both of these topics have come up over and over again. So we're, there's still lots of active science going on on these topics as well. Okay. 
Before I go there, I like to start with saying, what's so hard about this? Why, why, are, why are there so many people taking so long to figure out the answers to this question, how the jet stream is going to respond to human activity? And I tend to boil it down to, well, a minimum of at least three issues okay, that apply to both of these problems. The first is there's a lot of noise. And that's why my title here is Finding the Music in the Noise, the music potentially being some, some signal from human activity and the noise being everything else. So what do I mean by this noise? Well, actually, the noise of the jet stream goes back as far, uh, uh, being known by humans, goes back as far as 1230 AD from this very famous journal called the King's Mirror in Norway. And I, I am going to read this. I typically don't like when people read quotes, but it's pretty cool. So I'm going to read this one. So it is in the nature of the glacier to emit a cold and continuous breath, which drives the storm clouds away, but in the neighboring lands, often have to suffer inasmuch as all the storms the glacier drives away from itself come upon others with keen blasts. Mm -hmm. So what is this saying? First of all, the glacier is Greenland in this case. Mm -hmm. All right. And what does this mean? This means, hey, if the jet stream doesn't send the storms our way, some other poor people are going to get it. We'll get nice weather. But it doesn't mean that there weren't any storms. It means someone else got it. And it's this idea that the jet stream shifts around. If it doesn't send storms in one place, it sends it in the other. And back in 1230 AD, we're not I'm not talking about climate change here. I'm just talking about the wobbles of the jet stream, even just on its own. And we call this climate noise or climate variability, or atmospheric variability. There's lots of names. OK. Um, an example of this noise, and I'll talk more about climate model simulations, but I want to show you this is a, this is a, a, general, or a, a, a climate model. And what they've done in this climate model is they take 1850 conditions, what we think Everything was like in 1850. But then they run it only with those 1850 conditions. That is, greenhouse gases are not increasing. Okay, Everything is just the same. It's always sort of 1850 with a lot of noise, this idea of chaos. There's always noise in our system. And this is where the jet stream is, where that pink band is located, Okay, in this case in the northern hemisphere. And my point is you see, first, a lot of wiggles. That's this noise I'm talking about. And secondly, you see there are time periods, sometimes 30 or 40 years, where it looks like the jet stream is moving, in this case, towards the Arctic. And other time periods where it looks like maybe the jet stream is moving south towards the equator. And this has nothing to do with climate change. This, the simulation doesn't have that in there. This has nothing to do with ozone depletion. This has nothing to do with Arctic sea ice loss, forced Arctic sea ice loss. All right. So there's a lot of noise. So this is why my job is fun. All right. Next, uh, this issue of correlation, if you've heard, correlation does not equal causation. Just because two things look like they go up and down together doesn't mean that one thing caused the other. And I have two sort of silly examples, but I think sometimes silly examples are the best ones. Um, so this is the idea of tornadoes and shark attacks. <laughs> if you look at these two lines, they actually go up and down pretty nicely together. And there actually was a movie called Sharknado recently. Um, <laughs> But I think we can all probably agree that these did not have much to do with one another. Okay? But if you didn't know anything about sharks or didn't know anything about tornadoes, maybe you'd think that either the red was causing, you know, the tornadoes were causing sharks, shark attacks, or vice versa. And what makes it complicated in our field in, in climate science is we don't always know about sharks or tornadoes. We're still learning about them. So figuring out who's causing what is really quite hard. Um, Another example that I like is, you know, this is a family circus cartoon. I wish they didn't turn on that seatbelt sign so much. Every time they do, it gets bumpy, <laughs> right? So this, this is part of, this is a really hard part of our, our problem. And I will show you, when we look at what's happened over the last few decades, have we seen changes or not, we're really battling this, this issue. Is this, is this correlation? Is this just things going up and down? Or is this actually some, something's causing something else? And la lastly, the causes or these drivers aren't always acting on their own. And that's going to come up multiple times today. So here's my example of, of, of the jet stream. And I'm going to talk about three pieces today. So first, when you think about just greenhouse gases warming uh, or warming our atmosphere, they tend to actually shift the jet streams. Remember, there's a northern hemisphere jet streams and a southern hemisphere jet stream. They tend to shift the jet stream towards their respective poles. OK, and we'll talk about we'll talk about that. But at the same time, we also have ice melting. And it turns out melting ice tends to try and push the jet the other way. And these two things are happening right now at the same time. Okay? And lastly, when we think about the ozone hole and ozone recovery, so the, the recovery of the ozone hole or ozone coming back, it can shift the jet either towards the equator or towards the pole. 
And all of these things are happening right now at the same time. So figuring out, and I'll, I'll talk more about this, but this tug of war is one of the, the fun parts of, of my job and lots of people's jobs here. Okay. All right. So because of these three issues, I tend to split the, the question that I'm asking into three different questions, make it more complicated. Right. But hopefully it will make it easier ultimately. And, and I, I'm going to talk about this framework for both the ozone hole and Arctic sea ice loss with these three questions. And the first, the first question here is, can it? So the question is, can, for example, for example, sea ice melting change the jet stream? Okay. The next question is, has it? Have we seen it happen? Can I actually point to something from our observational record and say there's a change in the jet stream and it's from ice loss? And the next question people want to know is, will it? Looking forward, will this continue to happen or when will I see it? When will I know that the jet stream has changed? And all of these questions, I'm going to argue, are, are actually a little bit different and a little bit distinct. And some of them I think I can confidently answer based on decades of, of hard work from the community. And others I'm not so sure we can answer yet. Um, and often I think, at least in the media, they get confused about which is which. Um, OK, so let's start with looking at the ozone hole. See so ozone hole here? Um, this is a picture of total column ozone, so looking at how much ozone is in the whole atmosphere if you just look up at any point. So just orient you here, we're in the southern hemisphere. And let's talk about what the ozone hole is. September 2006 was the biggest ozone hole we've ever seen. Okay. And in September of 1979, for comparison, this is what that same picture looks like. And so you can see the darker blue implying that ozone has really gone away. It, it, it's been depleted. It's now, September 2015, actually, you, you can't really tell from the colors, but it's actually rebounding a bit. It's coming back slowly. All right. Um, so really, we, we hope that September 2006 was, was the lowest that we'll see. So what, why do we have an ozone hole? Well, this idea of, let's see if I can say it, chlorofluorocarbons. There we go. CFCs. They're in from... Uh, something that was in, say, hairspray, refrigerants, et cetera. And in the 1980s, they realized, hey, hold on a second. These things are bad. The ozone is going away in the southern hemisphere. So there's the 1988 Montreal Protocol, which was signed by over 40 countries, including the US, saying, hey, we're going to get rid of these. We need to start getting rid of these and change it for something else. And they did. Um, and the exciting thing is it worked. So really, we think that this is the lowest that, a, that ozone hole will get because actually ozone will co start coming back. And if you look at time here, the blue is a picture of how much ozone is in this region in these pictures over um, in October. And we can see this decline in ozone and now this rebound and this coming back. And we expect it to come back um, and, and be relatively all the way back by you know, the end of the 21st century because of what we've done. So the question is, with these changes in ozone, have we seen changes in, in the jet stream? All right, so the first question is, can it? Can ozone depletion in the southern hemisphere actually impact those winds? And I will tell you from lots of studies that people have done where what they do, um, well, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you the answer first. And the answer is yes, it can. And actually what it does, so here's my little schematic to orient you. This is the equator. This is where you want to go on vacation, right? Well, unless you're here. <laughs> um, and here's the pole. Here's my penguin. So the jet stream here is, as I said, the, the winds increase with height. The jet stream t tends to shift poleward with ozone depletion. And that's because we end up having this cooling because ozone absorbs solar radiation. And so when their ozone's not there, it's actually colder. And this causes the jet stream to shift in this direction. And how do people know this? Well, we, have, we can run models where we put in an ozone hole. We, we make it have an ozone hole, and we see what happens. And in this, these cases, we get the jet stream to move. OK. So that part, I, I think, is, is I think the can it. We understand the physics behind it. And the answer is yes, this can have an impact. That doesn't actually mean we've seen anything. And it doesn't actually necessarily mean we're going to see changes in the future. So the answer has it. We can go to many climate models. And I typically think of this picture when I think of all the climate models we have. We don't just have one. We have many, many climate models out there. And they're all made and, and worked on by different groups throughout the world. And what we can do is we can go and look at these models and say, do we see 
a way for ozone depletion to actually impact the jet stream. And the way we do that, um, if, you, if you've been to these talks before, my guess is you've, you've heard of these, these climate scenarios where people put in changes in CO2 into the future and we ask what will happen um, over the 21st century. And this looks very complicated, but this just shows how much carbon dioxide is being put into the atmosphere. And this red line is a very extreme case um, where it's, it, yeah, it's a very extreme case where these other colors are, say, under mi more mitigation or, or less CO2 going into the atmosphere. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the runs where there's a lot of CO2 going in there, but they also have ozone depletion. And we're going to look at what happens. So this is the one plot I will show you, but I will walk you through it because hopefully it, it, it tells the story. So what we have here is this is time here. And this is where the jet moves. If it moves up, it means it's moving towards the equator. And if it moves down, it means it's moving towards the penguins. Every one of these gray lines is a different model, simulating what the jet stream is doing over this period. So first, this is that number one problem. There's a lot of noise. If you look at the gray lines, they're very, very wiggly. Okay, That's this noise we're trying to figure out. But when you look at the black line, which is trying to find what's consistent across all these models, we see the jet stream hasn't moved, doesn't move much until about 1970, when it drastically shifts towards the south or towards the pole. And this is that signature, that idea that ozone depletion is potentially moving the jet stream south. So this is our ozone depletion period. Now, if you plot observations where we've actually seen a significant shift of the jet stream in the southern hemisphere, it lines up, in, in all honesty, unbelievably well. Um, and that's this blue line. This is what we've actually seen the jet stream do. So we've seen the jet stream move during this period when we know ozone, this ozone hole should be causing it to move in this direction. Now, you might say, how do we know this isn't CO2? Remember one of, my, one of my other comments, number three, was drivers are always happening at the same time. How do we know this isn't, say, the idea of greenhouse gases or CO2 going up into the atmosphere? And it turns out you can use sort of a little trick, which is the ozone hole is strongest in the spring, and it's relatively weak in other seasons. So if that's the case, we shouldn't see the jet stream shift in other seasons. And it turns out if you make a plot of, in this case, winter, we, we don't see that, that movement towards, towards the penguins. And so this is a, a, it, the idea that maybe we actually are seeing ozone depletion here. So it's, it's using the seasonality or the, when the seasons, what, which seasons we should see something in which we don't, helps us figure out where the signal is in all of this noise. OK. Um, lastly, and this was a discussion we already had today in our, in our workshop, was that these changes in the winds are not just about the weather, but they can also potentially influence what the ocean is doing. And that there have been studies arguing that we've seen changes in the ocean circulation due to ozone depletion shifting the jet around. All right, and lastly, for this problem, we have to say, will it? OK, what about looking into the, into the future? What about 2050 or 2100? What might we expect then? Now, I said that we expect ozone to recover, to bounce back. So what's that going to do to the jet stream? Well, if it bounces back, we expect this, this is going to get warmer up here, because more ozone is up there. In that case, we expect the jet stream to move back towards the equator. Okay. Now, what makes the problem interesting here is we also have CO2 increasing in our atmosphere. And it, there's, we have more and more and more every year. And CO2 happens to shift the jet in the other direction, towards the pole. And that's because there's largely this, this while, the whole, while, while the whole Earth warms, there's this preferential warming in this region of the atmosphere, up about 10 kilometers in the tropics. And it shifts the jet the other direction. And what this means is we end up with a tug of war. One side's pulling the jet stream one way, the other side's pulling the jet stream the other way. And the question is, who's going to win? And if you look, this is back to my same picture again, but if you look out to the future, during this recovery period where ozone's going to push the jet in the other direction, we actually see the jet doesn't move. And it's because these two, these two guys on the other ends of the rope are pulling at the same, approximately the same amount. But when we go way into the future, say the end of the 21st century, ozone holds largely recovered. It's done. But we still have CO2. And we expect the jet stream then to continue to move towards the pole. Oh, I have little snapshots here. Here we go. All right. 
So to summarize this, my three questions for the ozone hole, which was anthropogenic, it's due to human activity. Can it? Yes. We, we have lots of physical reasons to expect that the jet stream will respond to ozone depletion. Has it? Yes. And I, I would argue it's the dominant driver of the changes we've seen in the southern hemisphere jet stream over the few, last few decades. The ozone hole, not, not CO2. Now, will it? Yes. But I think that there, there's going to be this tug of war going on. And it depends on what decade you're interested in and what the jet stream is going to do. Who's going to win? The CO2? Or, or that ozone recovery piece. All right, so that's looking in the southern hemisphere, human activity in the southern hemisphere. For, but we're in the northern hemisphere, so let's jump. Let's jump to the north, OK? We'll talk here a little bit about Arctic sea ice loss. So the Arctic is warming with the rest of the globe. And if you've paid attention to the news, the ice is melting as well. It's melting a lot, and it's melting fast. And so one question is, what does this what might, how might this impact the jet stream and the weather where I live? That's what I get asked quite a bit. So let's, let's break this problem down again into these three pieces. Here's a, here's a plot looking at how temperatures have changed since 1960. And again, we see red mostly everywhere showing the Earth is warming, but it's really, really red up here at the pole. And if you look at what ice has been doing, we've had a record minimum in ice in 2012, and the second record for the lowest ice in 2016. So as the Arctic is warming, ice is also melting. These are, these are big signals. Um, now, the news has really caught on to this. And this is just from a few months ago, but pointing out that, hey, the Arctic is warming. And um, it, well, it warmed a lot <laughs> at one point here, 50 degrees warmer than normal. Um, but they also, the news has been very interested in how the Arctic melt may have, be affecting the weather patterns where we live. Um, let's see, the Arctic is getting crazy and maybe uh, you know, impacting the jet streams here. Another headline, this more extreme winter here in New England. Now I want to point out, this article is looking at the present day. This one's talking about looking into the future. So this is that can it, has it, and will it. Um, different, different articles addressing different types of questions. Um, in this case, they argue that the winds may actually be impacting sea ice loss. So this is where it gets confusing. Right? Correlation and causation. And, and finally, this one makes, is, is sort of funny. One of the most troubling ideas about climate change just found new evidence in its favor. And it is actually talking about the jet stream response to sea ice loss. This has been a very hot topic in the news. Um, so I figured I'd, I'd sort of tell my story here. OK. Um, so back to our little picture. Now we have our polar bear. I thought about switching the penguin and the polar bear to see, <laughs> see who's awake and who's sleeping. Um, so here's our jet stream again in our northern hemisphere, equator over here. And what we know is when Arctic sea ice, lot, or Arctic sea ice melts, the jet stream tends to shift that way, towards the equator. And how do we know this? Well, we go into the model again, and we run the model with, say, present, or present day sea ice and sea ice that's been really melted. And we see what happens. Does the jet stream move or not? And so we can say, can it? Yeah. We think we understand at least some of the ways this can happen. But a big question that a lot of us are, are asking is, but how? Just, you know, how, how does this actually work? And I would say there's a, the jury's still out. There are lots of ideas. They're still being tested. There are more ideas that are going to come up. Um, so this is really a new area, um, at least for me. Um, OK, but wait. Just because the Arctic can influence the jet stream doesn't mean that it has in a really significant way that we can see, that we can point to in that noise. And it doesn't mean that necessarily will in the future. So let's break these two bits down here. And so for the has it, has, have we seen Arctic sea ice loss impact the jet stream? Um, well, here is a picture of what ice has been doing, um, September sea ice, over the past few decades. And it's indeed going down. And if you look over here at these little squiggles, looking over the same time period. This is what the, where the jet stream is, and this is how fast it is. And maybe if you squint, you might say, I don't know, maybe it's going down a tiny bit. You know, maybe. Some of you are probably going, no way. <laughs> but it's noise. It's very noisy. Um, and if you think it is going down, then you still run the risk of is this correlation and causa or, or causation, what's going on. And the important thing is when you take the whole picture, when you look at the past 100 years, you see that the jet stream tends to wobble around a lot. 
And so it's very hard to say this little bit right here might have been due to ice loss over the last, say, five or 10 years when the jet stream likes to move a lot over decades and decades and decades. And this is what I mean by there's a lot of noise in this system. OK, another problem with has it makes it complicated is who's, who's pushing who. So one ar argument is that Arctic sea ice loss causes jet stream changes. But there are actually papers showing that jet stream changes cause Arctic warming. So we, we have, they could be both happening at the same time. But then we can bring in the tropics. It turns out that things going on in the tropics, like clouds and rainfall, can impact the Arctic, which could then impact the jet. We have the tropics influencing both at the same time, and the real world, which is probably all of the arrows everywhere, right? So how do we disentangle this piece? If it was only one of these, maybe we would have solved the problem by now. So this, this makes it difficult. And finally, um, an example of how we can sometimes be tricked is the winter of 2013-14 was unusually cold over the US. And recent, um, it had been suggested that maybe low ice, lo or ice loss was, was part of this reason why we had so much snow. Um, however, more recent work argues that it's actually the tropics in the ocean in the Pacific that caused this winter warming. So this is a, an example of how we're still working out these different pieces and trying to figure out who's causing who. So this has a problem, especially for Arctic sea ice in my mind, is there's, all of these apply. There's a lot of noise. We don't yet know about correlation and causation. Things aren't acting on their own. And the observational record is still relatively short. OK, so finally, we ask, will it? All right, maybe that's true for right now. But what about in the future? We expect ice to keep melting. What's going to happen then? OK. Now, I told you already here that as the Arctic keeps warming and sea ice melts, we expect the jet stream to move that way towards the equator. But I also mentioned earlier that with climate change and greenhouse gases, we actually expect warming in this location to push the jet in the other direction towards the pole. So once again, we have our two friends here that are going to fight it out. OK, so this is that tug of war looking into the future. It turns out, if we look, look at different seasons of the year, the winter is different. So if we look in the summer, it turns out this guy's a lot bigger. That is, we think climate change, this signal here is going to win, and the jet streams are actually in the summertime going to shift towards the pole. But in wintertime, we actually expect them to be about the same size. What that means is, we don't necessarily know yet which way the jet stream is going to move. Or maybe it won't move at all. Maybe, maybe these two sides will be equal. And this is where a lot, of, or a lot of work, at least that I'm interested in, is going into, is trying to understand, can we figure out which of these is going to win and why? Okay. So to summarize, for Arctic sea ice loss specifically, can it? I would argue yes. We have lots of evidence to believe that Arctic sea ice loss can change the jet stream. But in terms of looking for the music and the noise, there is so much noise in the present day. And the signal may be small, still small yet that we can't potentially find it. So if it is there, it's probably pretty small. But looking to the future, will it impact the jet stream? Is, is Arctic sea ice loss important over the next you know, 100 years, 50 years, 30 years? And the answer is, I think, yes. Because we need something, we'll have something pulling on that other side of the rope. Um, in terms of that, that CO2 response. OK, so my final thoughts. We made it. OK, so I would argue human activity can influence the jet stream. There's no question about that in my mind. However, in terms of the hazard, detecting whether a signal has emerged from the noise is really hard. And I think in the, in the southern hemisphere with the ozone hole, I think we found it. I think we see it. But for the northern hemisphere, with Arctic sea ice loss in this example, I, I, I'm not convinced yet that we've seen it. I think there's so much noise. The jet stream wobbles around so much that I, I don't think we've seen it yet. But this tug of war on the jet streams, I am quite confident, will continue or it will happen in the future. And the real question here, in my mind, or at least one of the questions I'm asking is, you know, which side is going to win? And that's why I think that you know, there's a lot of good work being done to try and understand maybe Maybe we just don't know enough yet about the system. And maybe actually one side will win, and, and we can figure that out. Um, 
which side wins, which way the jet stream shifts, has the potential to impact the weather where we live, whether the storms end up going a little bit north or a little bit south of where they typically would go. And you know, this, this makes you wonder a little bit if, if Oishi had been alive in 2099 and he'd looked up, maybe, maybe the jet stream wouldn't be there anymore, right? So um, th these are the types of questions that I get excited about every day. And hopefully some of you will too. So thank you very much.